All right, if um, I may convene us. I know we're still uh, registering at the door, but we can, we can uh, do that as we uh, all gather. I'm being roundly ignored. It's okay, <laughs> I'm sort of used to it. All right, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm moving us all to the middle so we can get going. All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for uh, coming. For those who I don't know, I'm Sandro Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. So welcome, welcome to our uh, Dean's Seminar on Contemporary Issues in Public Health. This event is part of our series of seminars that we convene throughout the year. They generally feature experts on issues that are central to the health of the public, and we invite guests to help sharpen our thinking and expose us to new perspectives and broaden our understanding of the conditions that shape health and well-being. Importantly, we often reflect that public health is a product of the cultural and social forces that create the conditions within which we live. And with that in mind, I think today's discussion tackles a topic that we sometimes overlook in our conversation about health and well-being, and that's the role of spirituality and religion in the production of health. And we're lucky to have with us some great people who are uniquely qualified to discuss this topic. This event is really shaped around Jim Sherblum. The Reverend Dr. Jim Sherblum has traveled a unique road to be with us today. He's an investor and company creator with two decades of executive experience in the biopharmaceutical industry. He's also an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister with a master's in, uh, in divinity and a doctorate in ministry from Andover Newton Theological School. And he also serves with distinction on our school's advisory board. Now, Jim has distilled the essence of his journey into his new book, Spiritual Audacity, Six Disciplines of Human Flourishing. The book speaks to the foundations of spiritual well-being as Jim has experienced them in his life. The structure today is as follows. Jim is going to talk first. After his talk, we're going to hear from three respondents who will each share their perspectives on how spirituality shapes public health. On a personal note, I have both enjoyed and learned from Jim over the past several years, and I certainly enjoyed and learned from reading his book. Jim, the floor is yours. So I've spent half my adult life working with scientists, and that colors how I look at the world. And I spent the other half of my life, adult life studying with mystics, and that equally colors how I look at the world. And I've become fascinated with human flourishing, something that you would think we would all be wanting to find more of, and much of our society is not structured in order to encourage. So why does one human being reacting to life's tribulations emerge stronger with greater health and well-being, while another human being facing very similar trials and tribulations gets crushed with a broken spirit. The question I'm posing is, can we increase human flourishing? Can we be intentional about it? This goes beyond nature and nurture, though genetics and environment do play a role. A key variable appears to lie in the practice of these six spiritual disciplines that can greatly enhance human flourishing. They are resilience, ego surrender, gratitude, generosity, mystery, and awakening. And you'll quickly perceive none of them require a particular spiritual path. You can find these same things taught in, among Taoists, as in Buddhists, as with Sufis, as with Christian mystics. And these paths lead to joy, accomplishment, and a sense of well-being. Who wouldn't seek that? Different religious traditions have called the resulting states of bliss that one can arrive at by such names as awakening, enlightenment, nirvana, heaven, or paradise. All of these terms capture some aspect of this way of being more fully human. So let me begin by acknowledging the extraordinary amount of privilege inherent in my own story so we can push, push past that. I grew up white, male, heterosexual, baby boomer, and Christian. I have been fortunate and blessed. That said, I also grew up in a very large, very religious family to highly educated parents in the impoverished seaside town of Tiverton, Rhode Island, hence the accent. But it turned out to be a pretty good socio location in which to flourish. My life's journey took me to Yale and then Harvard, and as such, I had incredible access to wealth and power. I have been an international strategy consultant, biotechnology executor, executive, venture capitalist, ordained clergy, and finally, creative nonfiction writer. I think I did well given my situation, and so I now live in, as a nature mystic and intuitive in transcendentalist Concord, Massachusetts, 
which is a fair cry from the kind of community I grew up in in Rhode Island. But discipline one, perhaps the core discipline that we need to find ways to foster in children growing up, resilience. Resilient people use a well-developed set of skills that help them to control their emotions, attention, and behavior. Self-regulation is important for forming intimate relationships, succeeding at work, and maintaining physical health. This from the book, The Resilience Factor. You may not picture me that way now, but I was a skinny, boisterous, energetic boy with a buzz cut and a pronounced Rhode Island accent, struggling to make my way in a turbulent world in order to survive and thrive, and so I decided to become a storyteller. My story begins in Newport, Rhode Island on a sunny Saturday in 1961. I was five years old. Nature was green and alive. The sea breeze gave a certain wistfulness to the day, and my heart pounded as I raised six of my eight siblings, most of them older, across the lawn of the Baptist minister's retirement home. I was intent on beating them to the used books table to the home's annual bazaar. I love books. Every June, my family would go to this giant yard sale to help support the retired ministers. In my small fist, I clutched a single quarter, the spending money my mother had given me for the day. I wanted to spend it all on books. Adult books were a quarter, children's hardcover books a dime, and children's paperbacks a nickel each. I was goal-oriented and very focused. I carefully picked up and perused each book, wondering how to maximize my money's worth until I finally caught the sales lady's attention. Sales lady, little boy, how old are you and how much do you have to spend? Me, I'm five and I only have a quarter, but I need to buy some books to read. Sales lady, we have a new rule, not posted yet, that any five-year-old can fill a brown grocery bag with as many books as he can read for about only 25 cents. <laughs> I was in heaven. I went home that afternoon with two dozen books stuffed into a shopping bag and the biggest grin on my face and concluded that heaven is when the world conspires for your happiness and well-being. I would engage in a lifelong endeavor to spend as much of my life as possible in this kind of heaven, and usually with plenty of books. We need to find ways to create cultures where children growing up can have those kinds of experiences of bringing them into that sense of being grounded in being. So let me tell you about my diverse baptisms. I've had two baptisms when I was 13 and 14. Our faith should be a source of our flourishing. Baptist youth, as you may know, come of age around 13 or 14. They become Christians by studying their Bible, faithfully attending worship services, participating in Christian youth activities, and then being plunged below moving water in what Baptists call full immersion baptism. Approaching my 13th birthday, I was somewhat ambivalent about being baptized. I didn't know if God thought I was ready yet. I had that kind of dependence on God. I figured he'd tell me if I was ready. But my younger siblings, Pat and Stevie, declared they were felt ready, so ready or not, I prepared to take the plunge. I knew what to expect from reading my Bible about Jesus' baptism in the Gospel of Mark, verse 1, chapter 10. It says this, Just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. Now, I was pretty sure already that the affirmation Jesus received from God, You are my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased, was supposed to be unique to his situation. But I was still counting on the heavens opening up and the scent of the Spirit. I was still counting on at least a feeling of welcome to salvation, that I'd be somehow changed, or at the very least, a well done, good and faithful servant. So I was more than a little disappointed when after being prayed over and then plunged under the cold water, I emerged merely breathless, wet, and cold. The earth did not quake. There was no descending spirit, and I felt no different than I had before. This lack of transcendence shook my confidence and made me wonder, what else were they telling me that wasn't true? The second time, I experienced my first radically transformative spiritual phenomenon the next year. We were in the woods at a Baptist youth retreat. We had spent most of the morning sitting in a dark, stuffy room. When we finally took a break late morning, I shot out of the room into the bright daylight of the surrounding forest making my way quickly up the path before anyone else could engage me in conversation. Suddenly, I noticed the path was shining before me. The leaves on the trees were emitting light, and the very trunks of the trees were luminous. The surrounding forest burst into song, almost as if the music of the spheres. I saw more shades and nuances of color than I've ever seen before. My eyes were dazzled. My ears could perceive and distinguish sounds at greater distances. 
I felt my hands and arms as waves of pure energy. I was pure energy, one with all being, at peace with all that could be perceived. This was my first truly spiritual awakening. I felt both joy and awe. So why do these two spiritual baptisms matter? Well, they help define who I am and how I respond to difficult circumstances and the conditions under which I flourish. Since public health is the result of human flourishing and the goal of public health is to increase human flourishing, this is important to know when you're dealing with someone is what is the basis of their flourishing? What gives your life meaning? What are the important conditions for you to flourish? Which brings me to discipline two, one that is hard to find at Yale and Harvard, ego surrender. <laughs> this being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows. This from the 14th century Sufi saint, Rumi. Buddhists tell a story from the early days of Buddha's ministry. A mother approached the Buddha following her husband's death. Her only human connection was with her baby, who now also lay dead against her breast. She wanted the Buddha to restore this child to life. He took compassion upon her and suggested that to save her child, she must find a mustard seed from a household that had never experienced death. Searching day after day, she never found such a place. As a result, she awakened to reality. She awakened to that which is. Trying to reverse her child's death was a natural and even admirable assertion of ego self in the face of an unpleasant reality. Even Buddha could not change that. Yet to have the possibility of awakening to reality, she needed first to surrender to what is. Upon awakening to reality, this young mother became a disciple of the Buddha. Many years later, she was one of the first women disciples to become fully and truly enlightened. Adjusting to unpleasant realities can often save us. We resist them, but they can, they can be saved salvation. At 18, my ego self encountered the world and lost. But in surrendering, I attained the possibility of awakening. My story of ego surrender begins with my going off to college at 17 and ends with my family's successful world tour at the age of 27. It includes my description of being overwhelmed at Yale, my brother coming out as gay, my academic struggles, my fiance's betrayal, and how I barely managed to hold it all together. My life turns around when I meet and court Loretta, Ace Harvard Business School, we get married, move to London with Bain, and welcome the birth of our daughter. You have to go through something like that kind of process to move to the other side of being ego controlled. Which brings me to discipline three, gratitude. Grateful people experience higher levels of positive emotions such as joy, enthusiasm, love, happiness, and optimism. The practice of gratitude as a discipline protects a person from the destructive impulses of envy, resentment, greed, and bitterness. This from Robert Edmonds' book, Thanks. And I had so much now to be grateful for. I didn't appreciate the spiritual mystery of death and resurrection until it became a metaphor of transformation in my life. When I was 20, I was in utter despair. So much was going wrong. How we imagine death and resurrection can be key to our health and well-being as we go through such periods. Miraculously, with deep resilience and surrender of my ego self, so much changed over a few years. Imagine my joy and gratitude at 28 as we settled back into our house in Framingham. I was happily married to Loretta. We had a baby daughter. Uh, my work paid extraordinarily well, and we had just completed the trip of a lifetime. But this is the key to the spiritual discipline of gratitude. When things, good things happen, it's easy to be grateful, even though we all know some people who aren't. But our joys and sorrows are woven fine together. If we engage with life, we experience both. If we live life with audacity, our joys and our sorrows multiply. And gratitude is foundational to human well-being. If we can't get to gratitude, we can't get to that greater sense of being well in the world. Of course, the spiritual discipline of gratitude works best when one has first learned resilience and ego surrender. It's gratitude for life as it is. Gratitude for the good things we seek for ourselves and others. Gratitude for the pain and suffering we endure along the way. Gratitude that we feel, that we suffer, that we endure. Gratitude in which we sometimes find new hope. Which brings me to discipline four, which is generosity. Not always a popular topic. Generous means freely giving more than is necessary or expected. 
So generosity includes the idea of open-handedness along with a connection to the internal experience and spirituality. Generosity ennobles us. It makes us great souls. This from Mark Hewitt's book, The Generosity Path. Life has its up and downs, and as I approached age 40, having lost my job, most of my net worth, and much of my industry reputation, but you'll need to read my book to hear the whole story about how that happened, and it's on the table back there, and Loretta's got some she can sell you. <laughs> but it was time to start again. After having worked 70 or 80 hours a week for most of my adult life, I suddenly had no job and no clear prospects. My career was in shambles. So I focused then on what I had, and I had an abundance of time. Time to spend with my wife and my children, time to read all those philosophical and spiritual books I hadn't gotten to read, time to think and to reevaluate my life. When we have those interruptions, what we do in that space in between, that liminal space, is really important. For the first time in years, I had time and sleep in abundance. I took comfort that Loretta's business was doing fine, the kids were doing well in school, and I had learned much from my dozen years in international business. And thanks to our financial prudence over decades, we had the financial wherewithal for me to contemplate and explore reality. I created a whole new life for myself as a successful venture catalyst. But then divine mystery emerged again. Nobody can tell me how, but I received a postcard from Andover Newton Theological School, which is my dad's old seminary here in Newton Center, inviting me to spend a day with them. My calendar in those days was always full. I looked at the date they proposed and it was wide open. I took this as a sign. So I went and spent the day with them and I loved the classes, I loved the professors and the students, I loved talking about things that had real meaning. I felt I was being called to be a minister of God. Now I knew what I should do with my life, so I called my wife Loretta and told her I was enrolling at Andover Newton Theological School in order to become an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister. There was a long pause. <laughs> She said you could take up golf. <laughs> Many men deal with their midlife crisis by taking up golf. As part of my preparation for ministry, though, I was required to undergo a chaplaincy training, which we called CPE. A student chaplain gradually learns to look upon joy and suffering with equanimity, and never, but never with indifference. One must be able to sit bedside with the former business leader facing their imminent death, to play with the child dying from leukemia, to laugh with the athlete recovering from broken bones, to hiring to bring hope to the alcoholic finally dying of his failing liver. Each person has stories of a lifetime. Each can be redeemed through these life stories. A chaplain learns to bring what they need to pray, comfort, laugh, make conversation, help make meaning from pain and suffering, or just offer a physical presence. I quickly befriended the nurses, and they, I get a daily printout of patients and their medical conditions, but the nurses would tell me who might best be get it, welcome my attention. But one time I approached a patient's room and the nurse was waving me away. You really don't want to go in there. She said the patient was bitter and mean. She said the patient was wasting away and dying. Still, I entered the room led by divine mystery. The patient would not talk to me. She refused to have me pray with her or for her, so we just sat for 30 minutes in silence. I could tell she was in deep pain. So I came back the next day, and the next. And finally, she began to trust me and told me her story. She said, when I was young, she said, I fell in love, married, and gave birth to a son. I loved my husband dearly, but over time, he became increasingly erratic, abusive, and finally died of a brain tumor. I winced. To endure such pain and loss so young is painful and difficult, I offered. She said, so I raised our son as a single parent. He was a great student. He earned an undergraduate degree from Yale and a medical degree from Dartmouth. On the very weekend, he was awarded his medical degree. He was killed in a car accident by a drunk driver. I grimaced. There's nothing I had to say. So I just said, how horrifying. She said, my Methodist minister told me this was God's will. Now I knew who I could be angry at. <laughs> but I shook my head. I said, what a horrible notion of God's love. I'm angry with God, she said. I wouldn't change, couldn't change that if I tried, yet I feel guilty for my anger. I became angry too. Faced with such suffering, you're right to be angry with God, I replied. Let us be angry with God together. Let's curse how miserably life has dealt with you. She looked at me in surprise. But aren't we risking eternal damnation with such anger? That image of a horrific 
God blocked her healing. Not at all, I reassured her. I'm on excellent terms with God. I know God was right there crying with you at the death of your husband and your son. The God I know is particularly close to those in pain and suffering. These are his special beloved children who he holds close. So we railed against the injustice of it. We complained about her Methodist minister's inadequate theology, which let her down in her time of need. Our faith, or our lack of it, deeply affects how we heal. Everyone you deal with in community is carrying some kind of burden, and how they conceptualize it affects how they will respond to it. Eventually, we even began to laugh through our tears. She told me stories of her son through the decades of their life together. She remembered the joys of new love with her husband when they were first married. She had so many wonderful, joyful stories, but they had been oppressed by the weight of her despair. As she remembered them and lifted them up, her health improved. After several weeks, she went home to resume her life again. Spirituality always impacts our health and healing. So my role as healer was to help make room for her to experience her, gain, her pain and righteous anger, and then use that experience to help bring her back to God. She could not heal without healing her relationship with God. A chaplain learns to exude generosity of spirit. Another powerful experience with divine mystery happened late in my parish ministry. A first-time mother in the congregation undergoing a difficult pregnancy went into premature labor delivering a baby boy who did not breathe for many minutes following birth. Her husband called me to meet them at the hospital. When I met them in the neonatal intensive care unit, the doctor said their son might not survive the weekend. And if he did, he might be so mentally compromised that he might never walk, or recognize his parents, or be able to do anything else ever for himself. We prayed together in our grief as I rubbed this tiny premature baby's bare back in expression of our love for him. The family gathered their closest friends and relatives in the hospital's small chapel. We lifted up this child, his parents, and our grief to God. We wept. We prayed for a miracle even as I gave the child last rites. He was beloved. We live surrounded by divine mystery and, but can, and cannot bend reality to our will. But if we practice resilience, surrender, gratitude, and generosity, sometimes reality bends in response to our faith and our love. As it turns out, his story had many more chapters, ending in this miracle baby eventually even being able to walk, to talk, and to communicate with his loving family. God works in mysterious ways and sometimes allows a chaplain to be a vehicle of his mercy. And for this, I praise the divine mystery Yet I also know from reading the Gospels that Jesus would have, have, would have always affirmed it was his parents' faith and love which saved this child. Which brings me to discipline five, the divine mystery. Now the first mystery is simply that there is a mystery, a mystery that can never be explained or understood, only in, encountered from time to time. Nothing is obvious, everything conceals something else. The Hebrew word for universe, olam, comes from the word for hidden. Something of the Holy One is hidden within. This from Rabbi Lawrence Kushner in his book, Honey from the Rock. Now my childhood faith was within a loving, caring, small town Baptist community and it served me well. But as to the nature of God, more was concealed than revealed. My dad was the Baptist minister and he says, don't talk about that. As young adults, Loretta and I chose to raise our kids and anchor our faith within the Unitarian Universalism of First Parish in Concord. It's broad, inclusive affirmation of the worth and dignity of every person, seeking justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, and acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations fit our sense of the divine mystery. But what do I mean by words such as God or divine mystery? The existential God is dead movement was popular among some Protestant theologians when I left the Baptists. This was the death of the big, white, omniscient, and all-powerful God in the sky when I die metaphysics. Such anthropomorphizing of the divine mystery no longer feels culturally appropriate. It disavows our participation in divine mystery while disempowering humanity. So at this stage of my life, I decided I was prepared to encounter whatever called me forward with fear, trembling, and incredible awe. I would travel deep into mystery. I would transform my health, my sense of wealth, and my overall sense of well-being in the process. Which brings me to discipline six, the final discipline, awakening. I went in search of enlightenment, knowledge, gnosis, wisdom, insight, oneness, ecstasy, and awakening. These all sound like wonderful things. They're all terms used to point toward that spark of the divine which feels like salvation in one religious tradition or another. 
awakening to the full range of possibilities in human life. Plato offers a wonderful metaphor for this in his, his metaphor of the cave, where everybody's sitting in a cave and such that you can't actually see reality. All you can see is with the fires behind you, the, the shadows that are cast by reality. So they make up stories of what's going on. And then one day, one person discovers he's actually not chained. He can get up and go encounter reality directly. And that reality encounters fills him with awe. And he goes back to tell his, his uh, mates. And they all don't want to look. They would rather stay with the shadows they know than the reality he has discovered. Now, the Buddha's middle path brought him inner clarity and enlightenment. He went through this meditation process so that he finally declared himself awake. Then he taught his wisdom about the core rising interdependence of all realities to all who would listen. How we perceive reality sometimes has an extraordinary impact on the reality that we experience. So let me end by talking a little bit about human flourishing, because this is where it has all brought me. Upon spiritually awakening, everything is changed, and yet it all remains the same. Instead of everything obstructing human flourishing, now everything empowers such flourishing. This is a mystical teaching in most world religions. I think public health results from human flourishing. To help populations flourish, we need to find who among us has developed resilience, mastered ego surrender, engages life with gratitude, or has a generous spirit. As I mentioned, those attributes, you can perhaps know someone in your circle of friends who it describes. These people can be a great source of community health and well-being. If we discern those living comfortably in divine mystery or thriving through awakening to ultimate reality, we can empower them to be champions of the spirit. You can readily recognize them if you don't know them immediately because they tend to have more meaningful human relationships. They tend to value them more highly, to be spiritually healthier, and to embrace life with joy and equanimity. Anger is a pretty good sign that they're not very far along that path. Such people can be key resources to increasing public health in our communities. We are transient beings with eternal life, thriving on inner contemplation and discovering paths through walking in the footsteps of enlightened teachers. And it changes us. Our brains are transformed. Neuroscientists are now doing MRI studies to see how the brain is transformed in this process. Notions of heaven and hell are relinquished. Seeing beyond good and evil brings forth a vitality of spirit, conquering the illusions of self. This is the nature of human spiritual maturity. Depending on where our life begins, it can be a long, long, hard journey to anything resembling human flourishing. Those who live in communities not structured to help support it have a nearly impossible time following this path. Yet it is a journey well worth the effort. Even a modest level of enlightenment brings a sense of well-being, peace, and transcendence to those who experience it. The Orthodox faithfully pass on such received wisdom from generation to generation, while the mystics seek to experience human flourishing directly. I encourage you to experience it for yourself. Blessed be and amen. Thank you, Jim, for that um, presentation. So our format is we're going to hold off on questions. We're going to have some discussants, and then we'll invite the uh, Jim and the discussants up on stage, and we'll have questions from the audience. So our first respondent is going to be Professor Michael Stein. Uh, Professor Stein is chair of our Department of Health, Law, Policy, and Management. He has done decades of work on substance use disorders, HIV, AIDS, sleep, pain, and mental health disorders. He is now going to talk about the impact of patient spirituality on public health. Michael. Speaking about spirituality makes me nervous. <clears throat> it makes me nervous because spirituality is one of those terms scientists, doctors, and public health practitioners usually avoid. It's what the poet Auden called an oblong word, one that should be printed in capital letters only. But Jim's beautiful and audacious book drew me in. How could I not respond to an author who describes his new grown capacity for joy, his resilience in the face of despair, his awakening. Jim, thank you for organizing this seminar and inviting me. I've worked my adult life as a doctor, and since I have not done formal research about spirituality or religion, I will speak as a doctor here. For me, the joining of spirituality and health 
occurs when I pay close attention to the needs of patients. For me, being awake, as Jim might put it, or paying close attention, means having a special interest in human qualities. The intriguing question then becomes, which particular human qualities is the awakened doctor interested in? So as a doctor, let me offer you this idea. The essential human quality that is intensified during illness is loneliness. If love and death are the subjects of poetry, loneliness is certainly the doctor's awakening subject. Addressing loneliness is where the spiritual partnership between patient and physician begins, where meaning begins, because illness creates those extended moments in the life that stand out from the rest of our lives. What do I mean by the loneliness of illness? I mean the set of limits of invisible walls surrounding the sudden and incomprehensible crime that has been done to one's body. If illness is a form of travel, an ill person goes, as Oliver Sacks' words sa says, to a hole in reality, a hole in time. Loneliness is a measure of depth the distance into that hole or chamber where a person has fallen and is separated from other people. With the arrival of illness, the patient is lost. That is, there is a particular alienation that illness brings. The ill person's distance from others is the most profound experience of illness, and this sense of otherness, of loneliness, is more common in illness than any other emotion and more dangerous and disturbing. As I speak about illness and loneliness, let me say that I believe the two are intertwined for all illnesses, from the head cold to the terminal disease. Furthermore, I believe that the ill person experiences loneliness whether they are at home or in the hospital, whether their sinusitis came on yesterday or their nausea has been relentless for a year, whether they live alone or with a partner and 11 children. This is not to say that loneliness is one thing to all people. Indeed, the crime of illness is committed upon persons with different natural aptitudes for loneliness, different personal histories and circumstances of illness, different resources that can temper suffering, different histories of isolation from before that inconceivable period preceding illness that must bear on after. The unique and irreplaceable body is the reference by which we make sense of our experience. We take this so much for granted we are hardly conscious of it, so that when our relationship with our body changes, the world loses meaning, or at least the meaning of the world changes. Within the thin chamber of our biological identity, the ill person becomes a new self. The old identity has been spoiled. Isn't it the case that when we get better we say, I feel like I'm myself again. This unexpected and unwanted intimacy with one's new self when one is ill, this new relationship with a new self has an effect on all our relationships. We pay less attention to others. In this way, the ill person's distance from others, those who are well, begins. For the sick, there is some loyalty to the outside world, but the real news comes from inside. Again, the sense of travel is key. Spirituality is often referred to as transport, transport to a different dimension. And here we begin to see the natural kinship of illness and spirituality. Now, loneliness is never the chief complaint of patients. No patient tells me my loneliness began three days ago. Part of this is that loneliness is often not a strong, clear state of feeling like disgust, or pain or rage. In addition, loneliness is not apparent to patient or caregiver until after the more pointed experience of terror and pain are dealt with. Loneliness is hidden. More public are the shame and apology, the helplessness and humiliation of dependence that come from the diminishment of illness. But as I've been trying to suggest, loneliness is the universal comorbidity of illness arriving soon after the chief complaint the shortness of breath for four days. The OED definition of loneliness is dejection because of want of company, sadness at the thought of it, a feeling of solitariness. 
Some health systems are now asking every patient about some pieces of this dictionary definition. For example, asking a person whether they live alone gets at one of the social determinants of health. But these are contextual questions pointing more toward the measurables of the external world rather than the spiritual one that is harder to gauge in a survey. Is loneliness susceptible to scientific scrutiny? Is this deep experience, which can be transient and subjective, meaningfully measurable? I've suggested that the measure of loneliness should be a negative metric, the distance or depth into the sonorous chamber of illness. Taking the patient's view, the ill person might measure their loneliness as how far they are from the world as it was supposed to be for them. The distance is obviously not merely physical, it is psychological. When we're sick, it is if we've gone away, as I've said. As friends and family and lovers recede from us, we recede from them. There is an apartness to illness, a spatial element, and losing touch with consensus reality is also at the root of spirituality, I believe. Let me say that I believe that nothing can completely undo the loneliness of illness except getting better. A sick person can never be wholly convinced they are safe and secure until they are well again. And if they know they will never be well again, they must be unbearably lonely. Awakening for Jim, as I understand it, includes what he calls the lesson of ego surrender, and illness always involves ego surrender, and therefore not only bewilders us, but presents an opportunity that makes us think about what it is that makes a life good, what it is about life that we should value. Illness is grief-stricken, is a grief-stricken project, but also a source of secular wisdom. And the ill person often imparts this mature wisdom to those who attend to her, to her doctor, for instance. I am not religious. I have no religious practice, I don't pray, I don't belong to a religious community. As I said, speaking about spirituality makes me nervous. But for those of us who are caregivers, for me as a doctor, spiritual illumination comes from trying to ease and understand loneliness, from trying to reach across to patients in that different and disturbed place we call illness, where there is no company, where nobody can truly follow. This spiritual illumination is always a gift and a total surprise. As Annie Dillard wrote, I cannot cause light. The most I can do is try to put myself in the path of its beam. Thank you, Michael. Our next respondent is going to be Caitlin Long. Um, Caitlin is a DRPH candidate at SPH. She is currently studying the role of voluntary and faith-inspired organizations in health systems. Her other public health work has been in the areas of chronic disease prevention, adolescent health, mental health, and positive deviance in vulnerable communities. Caitlin is going to discuss ecumenical religious practices in public health. Caitlin. Thank you. Well, it's an honor to be a part of this panel today. Thank you, Jim, for coming to share your life's lessons with us and to Dr. Stein for your comments about loneliness. My early exposures to public health uh, came through service with my church. My parents are pastors and our family, much like Jim's, uh, lived life deeply through the church, including service to the community. In college, I studied religion and music, but simultaneously developed interests that I was told were very public healthy. So I applied to an MPH program and started without really knowing what that was. So as an aside, if you are new here to BUSPH and you're feeling a little bit uh, outside your comfort zone, just know that you are not alone. As you embrace all the new course content, remember that where you come from and what you learned before you got here is an integral part of who you are and what you bring to this public health community. It wasn't until I started my doctorate here at BU that I realized my knowledge of how faith communities mobilize around health could actually be a part of what I contribute to public health. 
I now study faith-inspired health organizations and the way they respond to health system change. As a dissertating student, there is great temptation to regale you with all the things I think are interesting about this topic. But for the sake of your sanity and for the respect of my time limit, um, allow me to share just a few assets that I think um, are involved in faith-based and public health communities and how these assets can mirror each other and in other cases might supplement one another. Before I begin, one caveat that these lists are not comprehensive and certainly don't apply unilaterally to all public health professionals or faith-based communities. So let's start with the public health community because we are a great group. In keeping with Jim's theme of audacity, I think there is audacity in our field to imagine how things can be better for communities and for society at large. Building on a framework of human rights and the inherent dignity and worth of human beings. We focus intently on the social determinants of health, how the places that people live and learn and work and eat and play and even pray can impact health. And finally, we care about whether or not we've made an impact. We know how to do good interdisciplinary research and we hold ourselves accountable to our peers and to ethics oversight. So I think there's a lot to feel good about this group. Um, but a few words now about the assets of faith-based communities. First, faith communities are embedded in the larger community for the long haul. They don't work in three to five year grant cycles. They operate in centuries. Because of this, faith-based groups are deeply engaged in community life, well beyond defined spaces of worship. Faith communities guide people's deeply held beliefs about the nature of life and wholeness, what it means to live and to die. And they embrace distinct and powerful ways of thinking about human flourishing. For faith groups that are directly engaged in health, they can often navigate the delicate terrain where culture and beliefs run counter to best practice in medicine and public health. There are many common values between public health and faith communities, yet we know that for each asset I've mentioned, there is a corresponding challenge. I am not suggesting that public health should engage with religious groups without discretion or in a purely instrumental sense. But there are a few things that I think are important for us to consider about faith-based communities. First, it is critical for us to have religious literacy in our work as a natural extension of cultural humility. This means that we should complicate our assumptions about the religions we think we understand and continue to be learners about faiths and traditions that we know nothing about. Instead of stopping at broad labels like Muslim or Buddhist, Hindu or Christian, we must attempt to understand the core beliefs and values, practices and social norms that are attached to local faith communities. And then we need to ask questions. Faith and religious identity are always more nuanced in reality than a Wikipedia page will tell you. Here on campus, we should encourage people of faith to speak up in our classes and our forums about how their beliefs guide their thinking and their action in public health. This will help diversify and enrich our classroom discussions. And finally, we should remember that engagement with partners, including religious partners, is not always easy and not always advised. But there are times and places where partnership between public health and religious communities will enhance our shared impact on health and may even deepen our own understandings of wholeness. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. And our last um, respondent is Christina Gebel. Uh, Christina is a freelance writer, a doula, a childbirth educator. Her interests include the intersection of faith, spirituality, maternal health, and pregnancy. Uh, Christina is an alum of our program. She currently works for the March of Dimes in Massachusetts as their maternal and child health director, where she oversees their public health work through the state. She will discuss Roman Catholic practices in public health. Christina. So when I met with Jim, Kate, and Dr. St Dr. Stein a few weeks ago, we talked briefly about the nearly two years that I volunteered just across the street at Boston Medical Center to give communion to admitted Catholic patients. Jim asked me, 
If a doctor or nurse was looking at the chart, what is the one thing you would want him or her to know about the Catholic patient in their care? Trying to think of one thing is a challenge. So to attempt to get to the core, I need to reflect on an aspect of Catholicism that informs all of our teachings. One day while rounding with communion, I was in the ICU and did my usual check-in with the nurses to know whether patients had restrictions during my visit. When I read one patient's name, the nurse looked at me and shrugged. That patient has dementia. I mean, you can go in there, but I doubt the patient will understand anything you're saying. I don't think she meant it dismissively. She was likely trying to prepare me. However, her comment made me feel as though it was no different whether I visited that patient or not. And that triggered something in me. I thought immediately of my favorite patient, the one that I knew the best and who was dearest to my heart, my father. My father was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia at the age of 63. This rare form of dementia is, a, is degenerative and debilitating, so much so that patients lose their most basic functions, including the ability to read, write, speak, and eventually swallow. Putting my father in a nursing home was a torturous decision for my mother, despite my insistence that it was not possible for, to care for him any longer at home. We were lucky enough to have him placed at a Catholic nursing home not far from our house, a small comfort to us. But this nursing home was also fundamentally different. It upheld the dignity of my father from the day he was admitted until his death in June of 2014, one month after I graduated from BUSPH. Dignity is at the core of every single expression of Catholic teaching. We believe that each human being has dignity and that dignity does not waver to be more or less from the moment of conception until natural death. Because it is so valued, everything that we do or do not do is judged by this standard. As the US Conference of Catholic Bishops wrote, we believe that every person is precious, that people are more important than things, and that the measure of every institution is whether it threatens or enhances the life and dignity of the human person. And healthcare, as an institution, is no different. Having FTD, my father through, went through many moments, some might say were, quote, undignified. A once very intelligent man and an excellent writer, many who encountered him spoke to him loudly and in an infantile voice. A once very modest man, he needed to be naked and bathed by total strangers. And then there was the incident that will always stay with me. One morning, the nursing home aide came into a mess into his room. My dad had, during the night, taken off his diaper and smeared stool all over himself, the room, the walls, and the carpet. This deeply upset and troubled my mom when she arrived the next day. But instead of making her feel like my dad was a burden or infantile or undignified, the staff comforted my mom and assured her that this can happen and they would do everything they could to clean it up. And everything they did, washing the carpet and walls multiple times and thoroughly bathing my dad until there wasn't a trace that anything had happened. Another time when my dad was getting particularly combative while, being, while getting his bath at night in the evening, the nurse asked my mom an interesting question. What was Mart's daily routine before he got sick? My mom answered that he would wake up around four o'clock in the morning, shower, and then drive to his job, which was a machinist for General Electric. This nurse then switched my dad's bath time from PM to AM, and he responded positively especially after she began saying to him, come on, Mart, it's time to get up. You gotta go to work. You know you need to take a shower before you leave. Above all, there was no person that treated my dad with greater dignity than my mom. 
Together for 50 years, once he became ill, she treated him like any other time in their shared lives. She did not talk to him like a baby. She kissed him every time she visited him, despite his oral health being subpar at that point. And she didn't speak about him in front of him as if he wasn't there. To my mom and to the nurses who cared for him, it did make a difference whether or not I visited that patient in the ICU that day. The nurses knew there was a man inside. The nurses who cared for my dad knew that there was a man inside who was not once great, but was still great, who had preferences about his daily routine, who, re who retained his strong sense of modesty, who still had emotions, to my mother, the man beside her was no less the man she stood next to at their Catholic wedding ceremony saying, I promise to be true to you in sickness and in health. Now you might be thinking, Christina, are you trying to tell us that Catholics have some sort of hold on the concept of dignity? There are many doctors and nurses out there who would respond that their patients have dignity. I certainly agree. But even though we might think and say that someone has dignity, that does not mean that the care that we deliver is dignified. And that is a message for the clinical and public health community alike. Inherent dignity is the reason why movements like Death with Dignity do not make, sen do not make sense to us as Catholics on a moral, ethical, or even a rhetorical level. For Catholics, dignity never wavers no matter if it is a child dependent on its mother for nourishment in the womb, or a person with dementia, dependent on everyone around him for his most basic care and needs. Did my father die a death with dignity? Yes, because people around him saw him as more than his disease, and his care reflected that. What my number one patient, my favorite patient, and I, my number one dad taught me is that you cannot ever lose dignity. And that is what I want the person reading that chart to know. Thank you. So thank you all for um, a really moving set of talks. If we can actually have the, the uh, projector off so it doesn't blind the speakers. That's probably good. Um, I'm going to take questions from the audience, but I'm going to, I'm going to take the uh, prerogative that I'm on the podium to ask one opening question for all the panelists. So uh, I was wondering if, if you could all comment for a second on spirituality and religiosity. I was wondering if you could, if, if you, if you could help us um, wrap our brain around how to think about spirituality and religiosity, and in particular in the context of health, health of individuals and health of groups. Jim, why don't you start and then we'll go down. So for me, spirituality is what the work we're trying to get to, but religios... Relig they turned it on. <laughs> so we're looking to have the positive benefits of a rich interior life, a spiritual life. But religions grow up in order to give us some form and structure for that, so disciplines. I think of it when you are trying to deal with patients, we know that depressed patients really have much poorer outcomes than those who we can lift from depression. And they, 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 their experience of pain is magnified. If you go into a patient who's had a religious practice, let's take a Roman Catholic person who needs to in order to manage their pain and manage their depression, needs to be able to enter into that grounded place where they can surrender to the divine. If I just walk into that patient and say, our father, they will move right into this ritual that they've built up over a lifetime and say the our father and it will give them peace. It'll let them have that surrender. If I alternatively come in and say, um, Mother Mary, full of grace, they will move, a lifetime's experience will pull them into that place of gratitude for life. Religiosity isn't a value in and of itself. It helps, it gives us the discipline to experience the positive benefits of spirituality. Anybody else would like to comment on that? Caitlin, you're... Oh, okay. 
Yeah, I, I would echo some of what Jim is saying. I, and I think about it, I don't know the textbook definitions, um, as religiosity having slightly more structure and form and spirituality having more movement within and between those structures. Um, and I think when we're, as public health practitioners, when we're approaching a community, the first place to start is to understand what those structures are. What can we learn about authority in the community? What can we learn about ritual and practice? What can we even learn about the arc of the calendar year, especially when we're working outside of our own country? Um, religion has kind of infused its influence on, on the way that the year is celebrated. But it would be a little bit arrogant to assume that because we understand the religious structures, we then understand a person's spirituality. And that's where we move into the realm of being lifelong learners and really sitting with the people that we're hoping to serve, really sitting with not just community leaders, but community members themselves to see the way that they embody uh, their religion, the way that they relate to God, the way they re relate to others. And so those two things really kind of um, speak to each other, but they're distinct and the, the learning about them is ongoing. So, so I'll say a word, I'll, I'll change this a little bit since I talked about loneliness. I'll I'll provoke a little bit here. So, so I, I think of spirituality as private, and I think of as religiosity, parts of it being about faith as private, but parts of it in our culture being institutional, right? We have the religion acts as sort of a cultural being, right? It, 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 it controls our norms, our expectations, our behaviors, our priorities. It is part of our culture. Now, part of our culture at the moment, religiously, is that we have gone through and we live in a time where a large number of our religious clergy, particularly the evangelical clergy, um, ha have backed policies and policy makers. I'm in a policy department, so I'll speak to this. Have, have, have policy makers who, who have not um, uh, supported universal coverage. Now, it seems to me that most, if all of the religious writing I've ever known has been about social justice, about taking care of the left out, the left behind, the forgotten, the stranger, and yet we don't have in this country universal coverage. That seems to me in a certain way, and I'll just leave it for the audience, I consider that sort of, as an outsider, theological malpractice. <laughs> and so, I just want to leave you with that, that we live in a culture of theological malpractice and that the Christian clergy in particular is letting us down at the moment in a very important policy debate. Christina? Um, so I, I certainly, I, anyone who's friends with me on Facebook knows that I'm like in love with the Pope and in love with Catholicism and in love with so many things. But I, I certainly don't. I'm not a person that prescribes or recommends a, a certain religious path to anybody. I think it's a deeply personal journey. Um, so I think in, in the sense of this, where we're all coming at a different place, and some of us might not even consider ourselves religious or spiritual, um, the best way that I can describe it is there's been certain times in my life where I've been totally fine. And, and again, speaking to my privilege, I have a good family, I have enough food to eat, I have a job, and I do things that I enjoy in my free time. But I've had certain times in my life that even when I felt like that, that way, I felt that something was missing. And that's what leads me to believe that it's not just about shoring up um, the conditions to be healthy, but it's, a, it's, it's about a deeper inward journey of which everyone can describe that differently it's not just about being fine, but it's about truly flourishing. It's about truly being able to feel joy. And, um, you know, if you ask my mom and I why my dad got sick and why he wasn't cured by God, um, we would have two totally different answers coming from the same religion. I mean, starkly different answers. But I will say that there was a common language there, um, and there was a common inwardness in our journey through my father's illness that I connected with her on a deeper level and even though the world wasn't crashing down around me and even though my dad wasn't actively dying I went to that place inside of me that was one step further and I did that through faith and spirituality and religion so I think it, it I think it is an element of diversity it's an element of identity 
and it's an, an element that we can't overlook when we're discussing health and well-being. So. Thank you. Now I have many questions, but I don't want to monopolize. So let's open it up for, for questions from the group. Anybody? I'm going to go in the very back, and then I'll come in the front. Professor Feely. Um, this question is for Reverend Sherbloom. Um, it strikes me, I totally agree with you on the importance of flourishing and its impact on health, but it also strikes me as I listen to the panel, their spiritual experience reflects a strong family, usually good religious education, and very good secular education, if you will, and opportunities to get to that path in the woods. What I worry about is all the people for whom those opportunities are not available because of the social determinants, a fractured family life, poor education, poor environment. How do we as public health professionals bring other people to the kind of flourishing that you're talking about? A, a lot of my, my thinking on that is being shaped by Dean Galea's uh, writing about how do you deal with income inequality and the issues in the inner city. I think we really have to focus on fundamental structures. That if people have been growing up in an environment that is deeply fractured, where human flourishing is near impossible by on the kind of scale that I'm talking about, I don't think we scale back our expectations saying, well, they, it's OK if they just only get a certain level of flourishing. But instead, we have to look at what are the fundamental causes in the school system, in the neighborhoods, in, this, in the support system that we have is in our institutions to figure out how do we in, uh, increase flourishing. Um, I think, it, as it, was it Kate or was it Christina who basically said, the measure of an institution is how well you encourage such flourishing. I think if we looked at all of our public institutions along that measure, we could radically change the opportunity for flourishing of the ones who are most marginalized and oppressed. And I will say that um, the marginalized and oppressed actually, I think, do better at faith than a lot of us do. If you've been in some of the most poorest and abject poverty in, in the world and in the United States, there is a church, whether it's crumbling or a synagogue or a temple or even just a space in a public building where people go to gather and share um, and to love and to be loved. So I wouldn't necessarily say that it's like an inaccessible concept. That's, that's what I love most about it, is that it's accessible to everybody. And people who feel that way tend to find each other. And, th and that, that is community. And it doesn't necessarily require a structure or a certain amount of assets to, to create that. Um, I, I, I Michael, just, say, just one more comment. About this. So I, I just think that, again, I want to just talk to our cultural moment, which is that we live in this moment of sort of Calvinism contorted which is that we, we live in a moment where if you are poor, you are bad. And if you're bad, you go to hell. And if you're wit rich, you're good. And if you're good, you go to heaven. And I think that's the cultural moment of our, of our economic world. And I think we need to be aware of that moment and resist that moment. Jason. Can I just chime in here? Um, you know, I, I grew up in an evangelical community, so I, understand some of the nuance within and and I I would just caution us there is a political moment for sure um, but I think it would be um, insufficient to assume that the portrayal of these groups in the media and even by the polls are the totality of who these groups are and the way they express care for the poor the way they express identity with the least of these oftentimes the way that some of these communities do that is less visible to government agencies and to the public health community because it's done in, in distinct ways. Um, so I, I say that as actually kind of a hopeful pivot. I think in our moment right now, the temptation to run to the poles, right or left, not poles like, tech the poles like the polar opposites. Um, <laughs> the temptation to do that is great because there's anger and there's certainty and there's fierceness on that. But I think our political moment demands people who can be boundary crossers and who can speak multiple languages. Um, so the language of community health or public health and the community, the language of faith. And to kind of say where there are commonalities, maybe where um, 
pastors in particular who don't advocate for certain policies preach a very different message on Sunday. But those, those conversations and that kind of advocacy is more nuanced. I don't know that we do a course on that. Um, but I, I, just, I just want to caution us to, that's the exact type of assumption that I think we need to work hard to push back against, especially in a moment where the right and the left in our country are pretty deeply divided. That's a fascinating conversation. So let me, just in the interest of time, there are three hands up. So let me ask the three of you, one, two, three, to say your question, and then I'll turn it over to the panel just to be a bit more efficient. So right here, and then here and here. So um, I was thinking about something that Caitlin said um, when you mentioned that you feel that s public health students should be encouraged to speak about how their spirituality might influence their approach towards public health. And I was kind of struggling to think of an example of that because that's not something that I've seen uh, in my classes, even though I agree with you. And um, I sort of feel like uh, the only, the easiest route where that would be realistic is if someone were to say, like, I have this spiritual background and I believe that everyone should be kind to each other and therefore, like, we should provide health care and take care of everyone. But at the same time, that could be really easily, um, when issues of morality come into play, like someone could easily say, I have this spiritual background and I believe that men having sex with men is immoral or I believe Im abortion is immoral and then tie that morality into the health consequence, negative health consequences. So this is probably a really tricky question, but how do you sort of reconcile or how can you reconcile issues of morality that are specific coming from spirituality with the sort of in public health, you want to be very neutral and scientific. So okay. yeah. it's a great question. So hold on, hold on, don't oh. answer. We're going to take three questions. Them. Question one is morality, uh, spirituality. Question two. Um, I, I there's, there's a microphone right there. Thank you. Um, I also wanted, uh, I, I used to do a lot of health disparity research and in community that was the poorest, uh, the church was always actually one of the community centers and a center of health and resilience. And that's how people who had the least actually were able to survive, was with, ch with church that had healthy churches were able to keep the community, especially in the, in the African American tradition, the church was just vital in the community health. My question is that as a primary care physician, I found that if I can connect with my patient to some spiritual moment, that can lead to a bond that lead to further health. And I, I just wanted to see if that's some of the things that, that you're trying to pull that you find also in this audacity, spiritual moment mm -hmm. in health. Very good. Question right there. So uh, I don't know if this is on it, or not. It's on, thank, it's on. Uh, hmm? it's, it's on, on yeah. So th thank you, Caitlin, for what you said. My question is about how can we learn to speak about all of this with more nuance and contextuality. So full disclosure, I teach spirituality, social justice, and clinical social work practice over at the School of Social Work. I'm well aware of like um, somebody like Reverend Barber who does the Moral Monday movement and has created a whole moral campaign across the country working across faith traditions, okay, and speaks to being an evangelical. People like, um, who uh, so, um, sojourners, uh, Jim Wallace, am I saying it right? Okay, so there are people who are within the evangelical tradition who are deep liberals and deeply committed to social justice work, and I think we really need to be careful about our language and really do more research and more, um, uh, really investigate this more. So let me get the panel, Caitlin, why don't you start first and uh, then sure. we'll make sure everybody has a turn. Okay, well I appreciate your question uh, a lot and I think it ties to what you're asking as well. Um, I, think, I think not talking about these things in the classroom would be the greatest tragedy because if we can't have difficult conversations in the classroom, where will we have them? Um, public health does operate on a core set of principles and so part of our training here is to identify what those values are and we really begin and end at human rights. How do we envision uh, communities where people have an equal chance and how do we push back against structures that are inhibiting that opportunity for health and fullness. At the same time, uh, we also deal with a lot of kind of touchy moral areas and it would be really false to pretend that um, our certainty in this community about um, 
abortion or about um, the relationships in the gay community or marriage equality are the way that the entire population thinks. I mean, we're a population health discipline, so therefore it's incumbent upon us to think through how do we communicate our policies, how do we communicate our priorities to folks that don't agree with us, which are a lot in this country. So this is the perfect time for people to raise that or to voice how they grew up in a community that thought a certain way about abortion. Catholic students are a wonderful example, and Christina can probably speak to this. There's some nuance there for folks who might see abortion as immoral, but that it should also be legal. And that is the kind of relationship that I think we need to be able to hear students say, um, because I, it's a gateway to understanding how a lot of folks we try to serve might also feel about the issue, as opposed to seeing things in binaries, black and white. Um, I think we live in a both and kind of a world, and it would be a tragedy in public health to pretend that everyone is liberal and everyone thinks in this way and that if we just held hands tighter and formed a circle around society, it would be better. That's not true at all. Um, a part of our job is to, to set precedents, to create policies, but another part of our job is to serve communities where they're at. And oftentimes that will include serving people who we don't agree with and who don't agree with us. So kind of encountering that dissonance in the classroom is important because it, it trains us to hear ideas we don't like and don't agree with and it helps develop a more concrete way of thinking through those issues, both, um, both with evidence and facts, but also with empathy. And those two things really do need to be tied together if we're gonna be change makers, in my opinion. And I'd like to, oh. Christina, go ahead. Oh, um, I'd like to talk, I'd, I'd like to follow Kate in the sense to keep the conversation um, about the student experience. So, so I am Catholic and I am pro-life and um, I, that's a part of my identity that I was like, okay, let's try not to become completely unpopular in 10 seconds in public health school because there's an assumption that everybody's pro-choice and everybody's liberal and everybody's Democrat and the way to be a good liberal Democrat public health person is to do X. You know, and so I stuffed myself um, for a good portion of my first year but then um, due to some faculty who are sitting here in the room and I won't put you on the spot, um, I realized that there were safe spaces to go to school every day and to be my full self. And I really regretted that I went to school thinking I could only be part of myself. I even thought like, oh, I, I shouldn't really friend anyone on Facebook because then they're gonna know, you know. <laughs> but I will say some of my very, very best friends are public health classmates who are pro-choice, who are working for Planned Parenthood. And what I came to realize was we really, and I know, I know it might be like nails on the chalkboard, but we really both do want the best for women. We see it very differently. And I wish so much that in these conversations we could move past morality and look at the nuances of the quote unquote teaching. Because I can tell you, um, one professor, and I'll, I'll be brief, but one professor here who teaches a reproductive justice class came up to me and said, can you just explain Catholic teaching on abortion? Um, because I want my students to at least know what the other side, quote unquote, feels. And I was like, totally, and I'm not gonna put my name on it. <laughs> you know? um, but somebody did know that I wrote it, and it was the TA for that course. And she was a really good friend of mine, and she, you know, she was privy to the, the, the plan. And she came up to me afterward, a few weeks later, and she said, Christina, she said, I don't agree with you, and you know that. But she said, I've never heard it explained that way to me before. And that was my frustration, is that I felt like the religious right had co-opted <clears throat> what it means to be pro-life, what it means to be Catholic, what it means to be a faith-filled person. And I felt like I came into public school having to almost like do extra to break down those stereotypes, when really underneath all of that was this extremely fruitful, wonderful conversation and, and some of my best friends. So I'm, I'm like here, here to Kate because to neglect this or to not become literate in these issues is, is really to, um, make people come to school feeling like they can't be their full self. So. Um, uh, Jim. Uh, let me try and speak to a couple of these 
points uh, from the perspective of a parish minister, because I know some things about how to help people become their best selves. One is holding each other accountable in love. So when somebody, as, as Kate modeled, here's somebody well-intentioned, make an overgeneralization about evangelicals, she goes, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people. I came from that place. It's a way to bring the dialogue to another level. When, when Christina says that people are making assumptions about what it means to be Catholic, and it doesn't resonate with her sense of it, she can able to start asking questions and, and putting her hand up and saying, you know, I'm one of those people that's not quite my, my experience. So it moves to a more genuine conversation. And that that genuine conversation allows us to hold each other accountable, but we can only do it if we can hold each other accountable in love. That we actually respect and honor each other in the process. The other thing that I have learned over many years is if you want to increase resilience, ego surrender, gratitude and generosity, bring the person you're talking to to that time in their life when they, they had that experience. So can you describe, I'm sitting bedside with someone in the hospital, can you describe for me a time when you had a really hard time and you found the, the courage to make your way through so that you emerged from that place? Tell me what that was like. And when they reach back and they find that, they are now primed so they're in much better shape to deal with the surgery or the illness or whatever they're going to else be chased with because they know they had the resources from their own experience. If you tell me a time you were really grateful for something that wasn't obvious when it happened, why you should be grateful for it, but it, it lifted you up and changed you in some way that you're grateful for, that allows them to go to a place in the, inside their own head so that when they're struggling with something really bad happening to them, they can find gratitude coming out of that as well. We have this gift we can give to each other. We can all increase our, each other's human flourishing by helping us bring back to our own best selves. Not by saying, gee, you ought to be more grateful, but rather encouraging out of someone's own experience where they knew gratitude. Michael. Yeah, I mean, I would just celebrate my colleagues here. I mean, I do think that what we're all talking about is sort of human connection. And I think we've used the word, Christina used the word about dignity, which is, I think, part of that respect for connection. I think that none of us here think that religions are monolithic. There are things with groups within religions. Reverend Barber is, would call himself an evangelist and takes to task many evangelists. I mean, one of his favorite lines of mine, Reverend Barber's favorite line is, um, Jesus set up free clinics. He never asked for a leper for a copay. <laughs> you know, so I think there are ways of sort of taking the, the language of religion and bringing it into a personal and even a policy way without making everything seem monolithic or impersonal. And so I, I, I applaud the others who believe this conversation has to be um, intertwined with lots of other conversations. So one of the, um, this conversation could go on for hours, but one of the traditions that we have with these seminars, which I think is important, perhaps borrowed from some of these institutions, is that we try to make sure that we can eat together a little bit. So we have a reception in the back, and we found that uh, people enjoy having a few minutes of informal conversation with our speakers. So to preserve that, I'm going to ask you to join me in saying thank you to this magnificent panel. Thank you. Well I want to um, particularly thank uh, Reverend Dr. Jim Sherblum for giving us the opportunity to come around this, um, thank him for his fantastic book that uh, really has helped me think a lot and I think is now pushing us as a school think about these